This video that you're about to watch is from my Omni model course. You can get access to it for free. Yes, for free by going to the link in the description below. Now let's get into the video. All right, now we are at the part of the course where we talk about key levels, where we get to really get into the fun of price action. So what are we gonna talk about in this video? We're gonna talk about the three different types of key levels. The first one is liquidity. The second one are imbalances. And the third one is order blocks. There's only three categories that you need to know for key levels. Yes, there are different types of key levels within each category, but there's only three main that you need to know in order to be a successful trader. So what are key levels? They're just predetermined levels where price will most likely have some type of reaction at. There's nothing more than that. So if we look at this picture right here, I have a chart of crude oil. And right now I have highlighted all the different, or not all, but majority of the key levels that we're gonna learn about. And what I want you to really look at right now is just the reaction that price is having when we come into these lines or these boxes. Look how price is just going higher and higher and these lines or boxes are just supporting price higher. This is what the key levels should do when they're used correctly. Now, it's also very important to highlight that the timing matters. Remember what I was saying in the previous videos, it's time then price. Nothing matters unless it is the right time of day. So if we look at the picture, this is a picture of crude oil. So crude oil is gonna follow the same kill zones that currencies did. So we had London open two to 5 a.m., New York open seven to 10 a.m., and then London close 10 to 12 p.m. So notice how all the key levels are being hit while we are within the kill zone. That is very key. If it's hitting a key level and it's not within a kill zone, the key level most likely will not work. We don't care if it works or doesn't work because we are only trading during these specific times of the day. So let's get into the first type of key level, which is liquidity. And what is that? It's simply where the money is stored. Nothing more, nothing less. It is where orders are at. So either people's entry orders, people's stop losses, or people's take profits are at liquidity. So the market is always going to seek liquidity. And how do we see that in the form of a chart? Well, we have swing highs and swing lows. A swing high is a candle, or a swing high is a candle that has a lower high to the left and a lower high to the right of it. And vice versa for a swing low. It's a candle to with a lower low to the left or higher low to the left, I'm sorry, and a higher low to the right of it. So if we look at the diagram, the picture, this is an example of a swing high because the candle to the left is lower and the candle to the right is higher. So that middle candle will be a swing high. That would be liquidity. Books and previous ways of trading have taught traders to place their entry orders, to place their stop losses or their take profits at these swing highs and lows. So that is why the algorithm is designed to go there. Remember, it's all designed to go against human psychology. You feel a little bit safer when you see that swing higher, swing low, like, okay, price reacted here, it shouldn't go past that level. Or price should go past that level and that's where I wanna take my money at because I'm greedy. I wanted to make a new high or I wanted to make a new low if I'm in a trade. So remember that it's designed to go against human psychology. That is why liquidity is seen in this form. And so there are five different types of liquidity. The first one is quarterly. So basically the highs and lows within the last three months or so. So there's four quarters in a year, 12 months in a year. So we divide that into three months for each quarter. The second one is going to be monthly highs. That is just a high of every individual month. There's going to be a lot of liquidity there. The second one is going to be your weekly high. So each week, the high and low, there's going to be liquidity there. Then moving on, we have our daily highs. So every single day, the high and low of that day. And now this is based off of New York time. So when you look at your charts on TradingView, you're going to see a lot of charts are based off of five o'clock or six o'clock PM because that is when the trading day ends. However, the algorithm works off of New York Eastern time. So 12 a.m. that midnight, that is the high or low of the day, wherever we're at then. So that is what it's gonna use for the daily liquidities. And then lastly, we have the session liquidities or the highs and lows within those specific kill zones that we talked about earlier. Now, 
the higher the liquidity, so the higher the chart working all the way from quarterly through session, the stronger the liquidity or the more amount of money is going to be there because these large funds and large institutions, they're not trading off of session liquidities. They're trading off of quarterly, monthly, and sometimes daily liquidity. So there's going to be more money there. So the algorithm is going to really, really want to seek those liquidities. Now, because it is a quarterly liquidity or a monthly liquidity, it's going to take longer to get there versus a session liquidity, which is why I like scalping because it's going to attack those liquidities much quicker than waiting months or days, weeks, whatever the case may be to attack these quarterly, monthly and daily highs and lows. And so now we're going to talk about divergence at liquidity. So remember how I was talking about there are quarter correlated markets, the previous video where we talked about correlated intra market. So for example, Euro versus the pound, they usually trade in the same direction, right? So they should take out highs at the same time and they should take out lows at the same time. They should attack the liquidity at the same time. However, when one correlated pair doesn't trade above a swing high or below a swing low while the other doesn't, then this is divergence at liquidity. And this may indicate that price might turn around and go in the opposite direction. Now, it's not 100% guaranteed. There's still other things that we need to learn in order to know if it's going to go the other way or not. But this can sometimes be an indication, have our antennas on alert, like, okay, we might be changing directions. Maybe we want to get a part, be a part of this move. And so there are three different types of divergences. The first one we're going to talk about is wick v wick. So basically whether it took out the high or low or whether one correlated pair took out a high while the other one didn't take out the high. So the wick, the very high of the candle. The second one we're going to talk about is body v body. And what is that? That's basically if we were to look at a chart and take all the wicks away and just look at the body. So you find that swing high or swing low and you just look at the bodies. And let's say Euro trades above the bodies with its own bodies, but the British pound bodies do not go above the previous high bodies. That would be another type of divergence at liquidity with the body V body. Moving on, the last one is wick V body. So now we're kind of marrying the first two together. So we're going to go back to Euro and pound again. And let's say Euro has a swing high and it trades above the swing high with its wicks and the bodies trade above the swing high and pound trades above the swing high, but only the wick goes above the swing high, not the bodies. So remember they are correlated. They are very tightly correlated. The body should also trade above if everything is in concert with each other. So if the bodies don't trade above that swing high for both of them, that is another type of divergence at liquidity. And now moving on to our next type of key level, we're going to start with imbalances. And the first type of imbalance is a fair value gap, which is basically when one part of a candle doesn't touch the next, next candle. So not the consecutive candle, but the candle following that. If they don't touch each other with each, with the wicks, then that is a gap in price. And we call that a fair value gap. So all imbalances can be split into quadrants. I want to preface that. So all the different types of imbalances, if you measure the range and you split that into 25, 50 and 75%, those are very specific levels that price can bounce off. And the 50% line of every imbalance is going to be called consequent encroachment. And that is going to be the most sensitive area of every single imbalance that we cover. So, this is an example of a fair value gap. Notice how the first green candle, the higher one, the low of that candle doesn't touch the high of the next, next candle. So that gap in price is a fair value gap. And I don't have it marked out here, but you can see that price trades back into that range and we hit the 50% line, also known as consequent encroachment. And you can see the reaction at, at that level and it trades lower. Now, moving on to the next type of imbalance, we have inversion fair value gap. And what is that? It's basically a fair value gap that was traded through that failed. So if we go back to the last example, that this fair value gap, it traded into it and then went lower. But for an inversion fair value gap, let's say that fair value gap failed and got traded through. Now that is an inversion fair value gap. 
So it's basically just a fair value gap that failed. Now, when you have a fair value gap overlapping with an inversion fair value gap, so let's say that price traded through that previous fair value gap that we were looking at, and it traded through it, making that an inversion fair value gap. But in that move that it traded through it, it created like its own fair value gap. This is called a balanced price range. And these are the most sensitive types of imbalances. You're going to see the strongest reactions at balanced price ranges. They are one of the biggest keys to how price moves. So here's an example of a balanced price range. We have a fair value gap price trades through that fair value gap. And then we come back into it going into that inversion fair value gap. But notice how when price traded through the fair value gap turned inversion fair value gap, it created its own fair value gap. So that is why we would call that a balanced price range. And you can see the sensitivity when we hit it, it even creates a gap just goes directly up. And that is what, typically happens when we trade into balanced price ranges. Now, moving on to the next type of imbalance, we have volume imbalance. And what is that? That's basically when the bodies of one candle doesn't touch the bodies of the consecutive candle. So not like a fair value gap where it's the next, next candle. Now we're looking at the very next candle, the consecutive candle. So when the bodies don't touch, that is a volume imbalance. Now, this is the weakest of all the imbalances. Price will many times trade through a volume imbalance and then reclaim it later. So it may trade through it, then come back up and then use the volume imbalance to go in the direction that it may go. But it is important to know about volume imbalances because sometimes they may be the only type of imbalance that appears on the chart. And that is the one that you want to use for your trade idea or your trade setup. So here's an example of a volume imbalance. Notice how at the purple lines that I have highlighted the bodies do not touch each other so that gap in price is called a volume imbalance we trade down into it and you can see the reaction and it goes higher as soon as it touches it. now i'm picking the best examples not everything is going to be as clean as this sometimes it takes two tries for a imbalance to work so that is why i have a rule of thumb that any key level so all key levels that we go over can be reclaimed twice so Another type of imbalance are wicks, especially like very long wicks. You want to pay attention to those. Wicks are like imbalances in price. And just like any, any other imbalance, we can measure and split it into quadrants. So 25, 50, and 75%. And that 50% is going to be that most effective, the most sensitive area of the wick, just like any other imbalance. So if you are using a wick, price should not close through 75%. If it closes through 75%, then it's probably just going to keep going higher and go for that high or low that the wick is. So here's an example of price using a wick as an imbalance. You can see we have this very, very long wick. I measured it out. So you can see the 75, the 25, and the 50% level. And you can see that price comes down all the way to the 75% level. But notice how the bodies do not close through the 75% level and it trades higher. I hope that you notice a trend because all imbalances, all key levels also follow this. You have to look at the bodies, not the wicks. Sometimes the wicks will trade through the key level, but as long as the bodies don't trade through the key level, then it's okay. It's still valid. It's still active. The bodies tell the stories, the wicks do damage. Remember that. Now, moving on to the next imbalance, we have the new week opening gap. So each week, there's a potential that there can be an opening gap. So there can be a gap from where we closed that on Friday to where we opened that on that Sunday. That range, that gap is also a type of imbalance that you want to pay attention to. And this imbalance is also referred to many times throughout the week. For most of the time. Now, if we're in a very like trending market, then they might only touch it once or not even touch it at all and just continue to trade higher, trade lower to continue the trend from the previous week. So like I was saying, when trending, it may only refer to this level only once during the week. Price can use up to the last 12 weeks. So up to the last 60 days of new week opening gaps. But generally the last four are the most relevant because that is the last month of trading. That is what the algorithm will refer to first. Now, if we are 
in a very trending environment or we're reaching like all time highs, not all time highs, but we're reaching some pretty new highs, then it may go back to 60 days. Now we have a real new week opening gap, which is only specific to bonds and indices. This is the difference between Friday's 4.15 p.m. closing price and Monday's 9.30 a.m. opening price. So when you're looking at TradingView, in the bottom right, you'll see three letters, either ETH or RTH. ETH stands for electronic trading hours and RTH stands for regular trading hours. So if you toggle it to regular trading hours, you'll be able to see these real new week opening gaps. So here's an example of a new week opening gap. We have Friday's closing price and we have Sunday's opening price. And I delineated it with these black lines and you can see how price is going back and forth between it. But you can notice how if we look all the way to the right, price trades through it, then comes back down into it. But notice how the body is respected and then we trade higher. Remember, the wicks do damage, the bodies tell the story. And here's just an example of how price traded on later in that week. So price hit that level. Remember, the bodies didn't close through it, and then we traded higher. Just to show you how strong these new week opening gaps can be. Now, here's an example of a real new week opening gap. So we have the Friday's 415 closing price and Monday's 930 opening price. Now look in the bottom right, you see how it says RTH. If I go back now, you can see how it says ETH. So if you toggle to RTH, you can easily see these opening gaps, but you can still see it on the ETH. Just know where the 415 closing price was and the 930 opening price is. But here's the gap. I'm measuring it out, splitting it up into quadrants, and you can see how price, it just misses the 75% level, but that's going to happen sometimes. But the purpose of this is to show you how strong these gaps are and to be wary of these gaps because a lot of people miss these types of gaps because they keep their chart on only ETH and they're just simply unaware of these real gaps on the regular trading hour chart. And so now moving on to the next type of imbalance, we have new day opening gap. So we just went over a new week opening gap. Hopefully you're Catching on to the trend, now we have new day opening gap, which is just the gap from one day's closing price to the next day's opening price. Now, just like with the new week opening gap, when trending, price may only refer to this level once during the week. Now, price can use up to the last five days of new day opening gaps, but generally it only likes to use the last three. But you still want to be wary of what the last five are. Just know that the last three are usually the most important ones. And also like with the new week opening gaps, we have real new day opening gaps that are specific to bonds and indices. And it's simply the difference between the 415 closing price and the 930 opening price the next day. And here's an example of the S&P 500. So you can see we had Wednesday, Wednesday's closing price and we had Thursday's opening price. You can see that gap. We trade through it, but notice how this isn't during a kill zone. Then we have a new day that starts. And then during London open, we hit just the top of the gap and it's a trending day. So it only refers to it once and it trades higher. But there's two things that I really want you to notice. One, remember no key levels work without the time being a factor first. So it didn't work or it wasn't used properly until we entered London open, which is a kill zone for indices. And here's an example of a real new day opening gap. And this example is in the 10 year treasury note. So we have Tuesday's 415 closing price and we have Wednesday's 930 opening price. We have the gap price comes down into it, touches just the top of it. And you can see the acceleration that we have during that time. And that's all that also happens to be during a kill zone for the 10 year treasury note. And so that covers it for all the different types of imbalances. Now we're gonna move on to our third category of key levels, which are order blocks. What is an order block? It's visually seen as either the last down close candle before an up move, so a bullish order block, or the last up close candle before a down move, so a bearish order block. Now they can be up to three consecutive candles, except on the M15 and the hourly chart. We can use up to four candles. So if there's four down close candles before an up move on the 15 or hourly chart, then all four together will create your order block. 
The most sensitive areas are the open and the 50% of the entire candle as well as the body of the candle. So you always want to measure the entire candle and you always want to measure the bodies of the candle. Find the individual 50% lines and we call that mean threshold. So remember for imbalances, it was called consequent encroachment. For order blocks, it's called mean threshold. And the reason why I have all these different names or why ICT created these names, because I didn't create these names. These are names given to them by ICT. All of these key levels were created by ICT. The reason why it has all these different names and we don't just call all the 50% lines consequent encroachment is that when we are talking about price and referring to price, when we get more into the more advanced concepts, if I just say, hey, look at mean threshold, you know, I'm talking about 50% of an order block versus if I say, hey, look at consequent encroachment, you're talking about 50% of some type of imbalance. And the highest probability order blocks will overlap with an imbalance. This is so key. If you're looking at a 15 minute order block, then you want to see, is there some type of imbalance that overlaps with that 15 minute order block? Or maybe in this case, it's a five minute imbalance within that 15 minute order block. So here's an example of an order block. We have these two consecutive up those candles before this down move. So once price trades under those up close candles, this order block becomes active. You can see price trades up into it and goes lower at a rapid speed. Now, when I'm measuring mean threshold, this is also important. I'm not measuring 50% of both candles. So combining both candles and measuring 50%, I'm not doing that. I'm only measuring mean threshold with the highest up close candle. So if we have consecutive to make up the entire order block, mean threshold is only used for the highest or the lowest. So in this case, it will be the highest. And I have that noted with the dotted green line and you can see how price reacts once it hits that level. Also notice how price comes very close to it, doesn't hit it, starts to trade lower with that, with that next candle. And then the very next candle, it hits it. it does like a little fake out. You'll see that price does that a lot to try and trick traders or get traders to enter early before the move will actually start. Now, moving on, we have mitigation blocks. This is a very specific type of order block. And it's seen on the chart as a type of inverted order block that took only one side of liquidity before trading through the order block. So essentially it's a failed order block, but it only took one side of liquidity before trading through the order block. And when we see the examples, hopefully it becomes a little bit more clear. It's a little bit hard to explain it through text, but I think seeing it visually will make it more clear to you guys. So for a bullish mitigation, it will be a failed bearish order block that only took buy side liquidity, but not sell side liquidity. And there'll be opposite for a bearish mitigation block. It will be a failed bullish order block that only took sell side liquidity, but not buy side liquidity. So here's an example of a mitigation block. So we took sell side liquidity and then we started to trade higher. So those down close candles before that up move, that was a bullish order block, but then it failed when we traded through it. So once it failed, it becomes a mitigation block because it only took sell side liquidity, but it never took buy side liquidity. So this would be a bearish mitigation block. And then you can see how price reacts once it trades into it. Now moving on to a breaker block. It's very similar to a mitigation block. It's a type of inverted order block, but in this case, it took both sides of liquidity. So it would take both buy side and sell side before trading through that order block to make it a failed order block. So for a bullish breaker, it would be a failed bearish order block that took both buy side and sell side. And for a bearish breaker, it would be a failed bullish order block that took both buy side and sell side. So here's an example of a breaker. You can see we took buy side kind of hard to see, but that is a swing high that's delineated with buy side. We take that and then we trade lower to take sell side. So when we trade lower, three consecutive up close candles at the time was a bearish order block, but then we trade through it. So it becomes a failed bearish order block. Then we trade back into it. So now it becomes a breaker because it took both sides of liquidity. Also notice how it becomes high probability because there is an imbalance within the breaker or any type of order block, they become 
higher probability when there is an imbalance. So if we go back to the mitigation block, the same thing, there is an imbalance, so it becomes high probability. And so that is it. We have finally got through all the different key levels that I personally use in my trading that I feel like are the only ones you need to know in order to be successful. There is a lot. This is admittedly one of the hardest sections to learn. There's a lot of knowledge that was thrown at you. So make sure you get into your charts and you practice them over and over again until spotting them becomes second nature. For me, the way that I became really good at it was every single day, I would look back at price. So I would not watch price live. I would go back because I was working a job at the time. I would go back later in the day. I would look at all my charts and I would just mark them up. I would mark up every single key level. So if I go back to the original slide, so let's go all the way back. So going back to this slide, see how I marked it up. I would do this every single day, every day without fail. I would mark this up. And this is when I was also within inner circles private mentorship group and what he Dude, would do, he would do the same thing so i would mark it up before i ever looked at his chart and then i would match it up with his chart to see hey what is he looking at that i'm not not looking at or maybe what am i looking at that probably doesn't even matter because he didn't put it on his chart and then after time after months and months of doing it my chart started to look identical to his and then that's when i knew i was on the right track and i was starting to learn this the right way so if you want something like that be sure to join my discord where I post charts like this every single day, but make sure that if you are going to do this, that you mark up your charts first before you ever look at mine and don't be scared of yours looking completely wrong. If I show you mine, they were completely wrong. I was marking up charts in the wrong time zone. I was marking up fair value gaps that weren't fair value gaps, breakers that weren't breakers. But over time, after months and months of doing it, I became a lot better at it. So I say all that to say this, give yourself grace, but make sure you're not cheating yourself by looking at my charts first before you mark up your own. But this service is provided to you in the discord. If you want to do that, just go to my website, allentrades.me, and you can find this service for you. But now we are done with all the key levels and it's time to move on. So in the next video, we're going to talk about price swings and how to view them, how to measure them and everything that comes with how the market moves as a whole. So I will see you guys in the next one.